Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today. I hope you've been inspired by what you heard last night and more than anything by all the people who you're meeting here. It is an incredible group of, of you who are here today and an amazing wealth of, of, of commitment and ideas and energy in the room. As a faculty member here at Northeastern, uh, I want to welcome you to our campus. We are thrilled to have you here. One of the things that I love about teaching at Northeastern is that it is a university that is committed to action. We find a lot of ways to get our students out in the world doing things while they're still students and they are really raring to get out there. Uh, and I can tell from all of your commitments and all that I've read about you uh, that, that all of you fit right in here, that um, you have exactly that same spirit. Uh, so I want to actually just ask you before anything else to just give yourselves a round of applause. I want to applaud you. In the words of James Baldwin, the world is before you and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. I think you've already figured that out uh, and you've shown by your commitments that you have no intention of leaving the world as you find it. Uh, I want to recognize in particular uh, two of the commitments among the participants uh, who are here today. The first commitment uh, comes from Alex Mativo and Jeremy Gisore of African Leadership University. Their commitment is called eLab. Electronic waste or the discarding of electrical and electronic equipment is one of the rapidly growing problems in our world. In 2016, there were over 45 million tons of e-waste generated, uh, an enormous growth over the last few years. And much of this e-waste is illegally exported to Africa, where it accumulates in landfills, pollutes local waters, and harms scavengers, hoping to find something worth selling. E-Lab seeks to prevent electronic waste from becoming a health hazard by turning it into jewelry and furniture that incorporates the art and culture of effective communities. This transformation process not only reduces the harmful effects of e-waste, uh, but in the process it also generates employment and income for local women who design jewelry from e-waste in the country of Lesotho. The eLab team that we have here before us plans to partner with art galleries in Nigeria to sell the products that are created in Lesotho. Uh, their, their products have already been showcased at New York's Fashion Week, and they are seeking to eradicate a thousand tons of electronic waste in Lesotho's capital to begin with. And in the coming year, eLab is committing to raising $15,000 to replicate its program in other locations. Thank you, Alex and Jeremy. I want to present you with this certificate here. Uh, next, I'd like to invite to the stage Nicholas Giordano and Sidney Axon, both of the University of Pennsylvania. As you may know, this country is in the grips of an opioid epidemic. Nationwide, there were over 64,000 deaths associated with drug overdoses last year, a 22% increase over 2015, which represents the largest annual increase ever recorded. Drug overdoses are now the leading cause of death for Americans under 50. In Philadelphia, where Nicholas and Sydney are based, uh, there are over 900 people who died from drug overdoses in 2016. 
Their project is called Improving Naloxone Access in Philadelphia, or INAP. It seeks to uh, expand access to naloxone, a medication that can immediately reverse a potentially fatal overdose. They're going to expand the availability and accessibility of this important medication uh, by getting it out to laypersons, and they're going to design and implement a nurse-led educational program to improve the understanding of how and when to use naloxone. After training community health nurse nurses, INAP will implement programs into community settings where vulnerable populations can be reached at addiction treatment centers, homeless shelters, Narcotics Anonymous, and AA. And because naloxone needs to be administered very quickly following an overdose, INAP will seek to train these individuals who may be nearest to an overdosed patient. Thank you, Nicholas and Sydney, for your commitment. While I'm saying thank yous, uh, I just want to say, first of all, a quick thank you to CGIU uh, for including me in this event today. And I also want to take a moment to thank all of the people behind the scenes uh, who've made this possible. Uh, sometimes at an event, a big event like this, our, our our attention is focused up here at the podium, and we, we lose track of how many people go into making something like this happen. There's the organizers, there's the tech staff who are here today, and I also particularly want to recognize all of the people who work here at this university, who prepare the food here, uh, who clean a, a, a space like this before we get here and after we leave. Uh, they're not up here today, but their work is very, very essential to what we do, and um, it is important for us to recognize that, I think, at every one of these events. Uh, so now I'm going to move to the topic at hand. Uh, this plenary session is entitled On the Move, Creating Opportunity for Refugees and Migrants. And we have a very distinguished group of panelists here today. I'm going to introduce, first we have uh, Dr. Madeline Albright, Dr. Albright needs no introduction, but let me just say she is the former uh, Secretary of State. She is the chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group and chair of the National Democratic Institute, as well as professor at Georgetown University. Welcome. Uh, next, we have David Millibrand, who is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. And finally, we have Sarai Espinosa Salamanca. She's the founder and CEO of Dreamers Roadmap. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there are over 250 million people in this world who are outside the country in which they were born. Some of those are people who left uh, for very happy reasons to pursue opportunities, but many of them are people who were propelled into migration uh, by war, persecution, climate change, and poverty. Uh, and included in that number are 22 and a half million people who fit the legal definition of a refugee, someone who's outside their country of origin uh, due to a well-founded fear of persecution on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. According to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, nearly 20 people are forcibly displaced every minute. Let that sink in for a moment. Nearly 20 people are displaced uh, every minute. 
Uh, yet at this time of unprecedented need, uh, what we're seeing is a, a well, we're seeing actually some very inspiring examples of people opening their arms and opening their doors uh, uh, to migrants and to refugees, but we're also seeing some very troubling signs of a backlash against refugees and migrants and of borders closing. Um, and so our, our task today is to talk both about those challenges and about how to create opportunities for refugees and migrants. Uh, so I, I would like to start with you, Madeline. Uh, you came to this country as a refugee at the age of 11, and uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that experience was like, uh, what you think it would be like today, and what, what has changed between that time and this time. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here with this great group of people. It's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so let me say, um, in uh, January 1993, President Clinton had a meeting at Camp David of the cabinet. And he turned to all of us and he said, tell me something about yourself that I don't know. And I said, my name is not Madeleine Albright. My name is Maria Yana Korbelova. Uh, and I was a refugee actually twice. The first time uh, when my father was with the government in exile in London during World War II, and then the second time when the communists took over Czechoslovakia in 1948 and we came to the United States. And what happened was that my father defected and asked for political asylum, and we became refugees. And when I became Secretary of State, I was given a document in which he had written to the Secretary of State begging for political asylum, which he got. Uh, and so I grew up in the United States. Um, I grew up in Colorado. And uh, because I spoke English, uh, with an English accent, um, I uh, was able to kind of fit in, but I wanted basically to be an American. That was what my great desire was, to really fit in and become an American. And in the 50s, it wasn't that hard, frankly, because this was a melting pot time in the United States, and I think people accepted uh, those of us that came here and, in fact, would say the following thing. Yeah, they would say, we're so sorry, your country's been taken over by a terrible system, you're welcome here, and when will you become a citizen? And so the situation was entirely different, I think, in terms of people wanting uh, people to come here and welcoming us. And despite the fact that I had very ethnic kind of parents that ate weird food and spoke with accents, um, I, I did, in fact, have the opportunity to fit in, and I'm very grateful. And when I describe myself, I describe myself as a grateful American. Thank you. So, uh, David, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, we, uh, our focus often, the focus on the news, has been on uh, refugees and migrants who are arriving in the United States, coming across the Mediterranean into Europe, uh, and about the reception uh, that, that they receive in those countries. But in fact, uh, the majority of refugees in, this uh, in the world are not arriving in Europe and the United States. They are arriving uh, in developing countries. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the work of the IRC and about the, um, what, what is going on on a global level in terms of the reception. Thank of you very much. Well, look, it's fantastic to be here. I got up at quarter to five this morning to come from New York, but this audience has energized me. And whenever I meet and see Madeline, uh, frankly, if she's got the energy of a 25-year-old, and uh, it really is always a privilege to be on the platform uh, with her. Look, we're in a situation where you can clap. It's okay. You can clap her. We can clap her every time she speaks and every time she gets mentioned, I think. Um, look, the, the truth is that it always annoys me when I hear people say the European refugee crisis. Because the truth is that the refugee crisis is in countries that are lower or middle income, not rich European countries. And when I hear Americans say, we don't know whether we can manage 90,000 refugees to come here, and I remember that Uganda has welcomed a million South Sudanese in the last year, when Bangladesh has accepted, when Bangladesh has accepted half a million Muslim minority Rohingya population from Myanmar in the last seven weeks, then you get a sense of perspective. And the truth is 
that if you count asylum seekers and refugees together, there's about 25 million people uh, who are in that category at the moment. Uh, the top 10 refugee hosting countries account for two and a half percent of global income. So they are poor and lower middle income countries. They are Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, which is one of the, uh, I suppose, middle income uh, countries, Uganda, Ethiopia. Iran actually has 800,000, 900,000 Afghan refugees. Pakistan still has two and a half million Afghan uh, refugees. So the refugee phenomenon is one from war-torn countries to lower middle income countries. And I've been doing this job for the last four years, and the most striking thing for me is that refugees are now displaced for a long time, not a short time. One's assumption and the, what's built into international law and into much of the public policy of the UN and other agencies is the assumption that refugees are displaced for a short time and then go home. But last year, less than 1% of the world's refugees went home. The average displacement for a refugee was 10 years. And once you've been a refugee for five years, you're likely to be out of your own country for 21 years. So with apologies for the blizzard of statistics, the point is that this is a lower middle income phenomenon. It's a long-term phenomenon. And it looks to me like a trend and not a blip. And so for an agency like ours, we're an international humanitarian charity. We were founded by Albert Einstein in 1933 to rescue Jews from Europe. Uh, we now operate in 30 countries offering health, education, uh, employment support, protection for women and kids. We have to change our operating model so that we're ready for urban humanitarian work, because most refugees are in camps, uh, not in camps. We have to be ready for education and employment work, not just healthcare to keep people alive. And we have to think about what is the relationship between refugees and the local population. Because it's not just in the UK or in the US that there are big issues about how refugees relate to local host populations. It's also in Kenya. It's also in Jordan. It's also in Lebanon. And so one of our principles is that we have to offer services not just to poor refugees, but also to vulnerable members of the local host population. Well, well speaking of education and of, of, of creating opportunities, uh, I want to turn to you, Sari. Uh, I, want, I, I would like you to, um, if you could, just tell us a little bit about what your experience has been um, in this country and, um, and what you are doing um, through Dreamers Roadmap to try to create, in particular, educational opportunities for Dreamers. And, and maybe tell us, for, for those particularly who aren't from the United States here, um, what is a Dreamer and, and what are you trying to do? Yeah, so likewise, thank you very much for being here. It's great uh, to be here this morning. I also woke up very early, but I flew in from California last night, so I flew in. I think I got here like at two in the morning, so I'm a little half asleep, but happy to be here. Um, so I came to this country from Mexico when I was four years old with my parents. Uh, we immigrated because of poverty, lack of opportunities, um, and we came to California where my sister and my brother had already resided for about five or six years. And uh, since I came so young, I went to kindergarten not long after I arrived, and I went to school like any other little American kid. But everything changed for me my senior year of high school. Um, when I applied for FAFSA, which is uh, financial aid from the federal government, uh, like all my other friends were applying, um, I was denied because I didn't have a social security number because I wasn't a legal permanent resident or a citizen of the United States, despite the fact that I had lived here my whole life. Um, so a dreamer uh, here in the United States for people that aren't from here is basically a student that was brought to this country as a minor and has kind of been here through the, throughout their whole life and are um, trying to work or get an education, but the opportunities aren't there. So that's exactly what happened to me. My, my senior year, I went to my counselor. I told her, you know what, FAFSA denied me. What are my financial options to go to college? I'm the first one in my family to graduate from high school, the first one to want to go to college, uh, which is very common with immigrant fam families as first-generation college students. Uh, we kind of, on top of the layer of being undocumented and being an immigrant, you're the first one in your family to go to college, so you're still figuring everything out as you go, um, which comes with a bunch of challenges. Uh, so I went back to my counselor a week later after I had told her my situation and my question, and she found one scholarship but she didn't look through the requirements. It also required you to have citizenship or permanent residency in this country. So I wasn't able to go to college right after, or at least the university that I wanted to go to, I couldn't go because I didn't have the money. So fast forward about six, seven years, I get the opportunity to 
um, be in a national competition where it was open to anybody in the country who had a solution to a problem and you had to solve it using technology. So I pitched an idea to create an app called Dreamers Roadmap that would help undocumented students across the country find scholarships to go to college. On average, there's about 65,000 students in the country that have to that go through this as they graduate, and no one had really taken the time to focus on these students and find resources for them. What are the next steps? Unless you had like a counselor or a teacher who was already educated about opportunities for students like us, uh, you didn't go to college. So I went to this competition, I pitched my idea, I shared my personal story. I'm not a tech person, I'm not a business person, but I had the passion and my personal story was a struggle, right? That was the problem that I was trying to solve and the app was the, the solution. I won first place in the country, I won $100,000 and came back home to create Dreamers Roadmap. Can't get better than that. <laughs> in terms of, uh, it's really an extraordinary story, uh, and I think that the so your your personal story, but also the story uh, of dreamers a, as a whole, uh, shows us that uh, that people can take take these issues into their own hands. I mean, the dreamers have totally changed the the debate in this country, um, and and showed people that you know who they were. And and uh, and that they could not be written off, and um, and particularly a few years ago, when uh, you know the tides have changed a bit, but um, a few years ago, when you really saw that power being exerted, and you saw this this ability to go to Washington and get the president to actually, you know, to to implement DACA, and I, I just, this is actually a question I think for for any of you, what are the, give us some stories here of how people are are taking, how, how refugees you've seen in camps, how uh, people are taking these issues and kind of, and, and, and changing the debate and changing how the world sees them. Well, I, I think that what is so important is the personal stories. When actually somebody meets somebody and they sound completely American and they have really lived here their whole lives, and it's not just some kind of statistic of a bu bunch of foreigners that have come to terrorize our country. Um, I think that makes a very big difference. So I was up on Capitol Hill not long ago, and the question really came up about DACA, and all of a sudden there were a group of young people that were coming through, and this young woman uh, was had an American education, and she sounded just exactly like you, but she was crying, and she said, I'm going to be thrown out of here for no reason whatsoever. And I think that that's the part is we have to really recognize the people behind this and understand. If you think about it, and I, um, I describe my story, which is very uh, placid in comparison to all of that, but if you think about it, I was brought here as a child uh, with no uh, documentation until my parents really had it. Uh, we became citizens at a time during the McCarthy era, so everybody thought somebody that didn't sound like them were communists. But the bottom line is that I think understanding what it's like to be brought here as a child and then all of a sudden having to fight not just whether you've got money or not, but to prove that you belong here. And so it's personalizing that that's so important rather than the, than the numbers and, and the kinds of things. And then to bring together what David was saying, I find appalling that uh, we have now lowered our numbers generally on how many um, refugees can come in. Uh, we are a very large country. By the way, I have not flown over it as much as I've driven through it. And we have lots and lots of room. And if we start lowering our numbers, then other countries, whether it's Uganda or the Germans, can say, how can you tell us what to do if, we, if you're not doing your share in all of this? Yeah. I mean, my, my perspective on this relates pretty directly to the idea of the CGIU and the breadth of people that are in this room today. What's the truth about the modern world? It's that the world is more connected than ever before, but the great danger is that we're consumed by the divisions between us. And the divisions are obvious. We're different colors, different religions. And the great danger is that the common humanity is lost. Now, why does common humanity get lost? It gets lost when people stop being people and they just become a big mass. They lose their humanity. And I think that's what's happened in respect of the refugee crisis, but also in some ways in respect of migration and migrant flows. I don't actually like the word migrant. When I was a child, the world was immigrant. Migrant has a certain pejorative tone 
to it. But if you just think about the refugee population, 25 million refugees, sounds like this amorphous mass, and you lose the individual perspective. And I think it's interesting what, which country has been one of the most forward industrialized countries in welcoming refugees in the last few years, it's Germany. And what was the turning point in Germany? The turning point was actually when Mrs. Merkel in 2015 was confronted by a young Palestinian girl. And the young Palestinian girl told her her story and then said, are you really telling me you're going to send me back to the Middle East? And the girl started crying. Mrs. Merkel had no answer. It was all on TV. And the humanity to what was previously described as a quote unquote flood, a quote unquote mass of people, took on its human characteristics. And my learning about this over the last uh, two or three years is that it's the voices of refugees and the stories of refugees that can actually break through, and not just to people's hearts, but to people's heads. Because the truth is that if we don't address these humanitarian crises, both by supporting countries like Uganda or Kenya or Jordan or Lebanon, if we don't support those countries, and if we don't welcome refugees to our own shores, these problems are going to get worse. They're actually going to metastasize and become bigger problems. And I think it's really important that in an audience where you've got people from all over the world, you've got people from I don't know, 70 or 80 different countries, I think, uh, it's really important to take away that idea that there's a precious common humanity that's being stripped away by uh, what's called populist politics. I mean, I always say populism is popular until it gets elected. And when it gets elected, it's got no answers. But that doesn't mean it can't be divisive and dangerous. And I think it's really important to hold on to that idea that Madeleine pinpointed, that there's a common humanity that we have to rescue from a discourse and a debate that is dehumanized and that turns, in the case of refugees, turns refugees into terrorists rather than into human beings. Well, for me, I think being a dreamer and being an immigrant, what, what, has, what I've seen in the past is that exactly, right? Putting a face to the stories, putting a face to the statistics and sharing our stories. The power of storytelling I've seen and I've lived it. I won $100,000 for sharing my story. Um, and we have changed people's minds and people's, uh, people's hearts based on these stories. And I think it's important, regardless of what country you're from, right, to put, when you have that opportunity to meet someone in the government of the United States, it's kind of like in the tech world, they say, what's your elevator pitch? What are you going to tell them? How, what, are, how, what are you going to do to make them change their mind? to do policies and accept more refugees to come into the country, to create immigration reform, which hasn't happened in so many years, and so many people are in need. When DACA came out, I remember it was, um, I, I was a DACA recipient for three years, and uh, I remember it was like a bittersweet moment because of the age gap, right? It was only, oh, from 15 to 31, and then it was like, well, what about everybody else? What about the people that came before us who didn't have any opportunities uh, or like Madeline was saying, right? You're a dreamer too. Like you came as a child and, you, and you've been here and you're an American and so are we. And that's kind of what we need to keep on portraying, but not just this specific pool of people, which the government has says, these are the good immigrants. There's 11 million of us and we are not terrorists. We are not committing crime. We are working hard in whichever way we can to give back to this country because it's our home and we're not gonna go anywhere. So might as well educate us and keep us here to give back to this country. I have to say, I think that if we're going to look at this also from the perspective of is this good for America uh, and um, our national security and a number of issues, and I can argue it that way. So for instance, there are a lot of uh, refugees that are in our armed services, uh, that are fighting for America in different places in terms of being uh, soldiers and Marines and, and part of everything. So there's the national security part. Then I look out at this audience, and I am a professor, and American, uh, you know, born American students benefit from having uh, different people in their classes, whether they are exchange students or dreamers, and it really adds to the educational experience. And then, obviously, there are people that work very hard. So what bothers me is that we are beginning to look at everything at this moment about what is good for America first. That, if, if we're going to go that direction, I can argue that 
dreamers and refugees and immigrants are good for the United States. And it has to be argued that way, too. Well, I, on that subject, I think what we're, we're talking about to some extent is line drawing, right? How lines get drawn around DACA, around refugees, around good immigrants versus bad immigrants. And uh, we're just seeing so much of that these days. I want to read um, a, brief, a brief, brief piece by the uh, writer and photographer Teju Cole that um, a, a piece he published in September of 2015. Uh, this was a moment when the world's attention was really focused on what was going on in the Mediterranean and this uh, enormous uh, flow of, of migrants across uh, the Mediterranean. And it was called Migrants Are Welcome. And it was a response to, you know, there were a lot of signs that went up that said refugees welcome at that time. And there were a lot of arguments made that the folks who were coming in these boats were not migrants, they were refugees and deserving of protection. And, and, and his response was, but here's the thing, migrants should be welcome too. Migrants are welcome. Some of the refugees become migrants once the in immediate danger is passed. Some migrants become refugees caught in an unexpected vortex of malice. I say refugee, I say migrant, I say neighbor, I say friend, because everyone is deserving of dignity. Because moving for economic benefit is itself a matter of life and death. Because money is the universal language, and to be deprived of it is to be deprived of a voice while everyone else is shouting. Sometimes the gun aimed at your head is grinding poverty or endless shabby struggle or soul-crushing tedium. And more than refugee or migrant, I say people and say it with compassion because everyone I love and everyone they love has at some point said tearful goodbyes and moved from place to place to seek new opportunities. And almost all of them have, by their movement, improved those new places. So my question for you, uh, it's a twofold question. One part of that is how do we both recognize the very real and specific needs that refugees have while at the same time not kind of increasing that line drawing of sort of good, good, good immigrants versus bad immigrants? Uh, and then the second question is how do we shift uh, the framework from one of, uh, of this being a crisis, of, of migration flows being a crisis, uh, to one uh, uh, that recognizes how much migration enriches, uh, as Natalie just said, enriches our communities. Well, uh, let me um, maybe in inject a bit of controversy into this, because I agree that everyone deserves love and dignity, but it is not the case that anyone has a right to move anywhere else in the world. And I think it's really important to understand why it was so hard to win rights for refugees and why it would be folly to blur the distinction between someone who cannot safely go home, because that is the definition of a refugee, someone who can't safely go be sent back home, and someone who's seeking a better life in another country. It's not that one is good and the other is bad, they're different. And it is the case in international law that countries have a responsibility to accept refugees, it's not the case that they have a responsibility to accept migrants. And that distinction is important because it seems to me that if we say 250 million people have the right to move anywhere in the world, we're bound to lose that political argument. Because if 250 million, then why not 2.5 billion? I mean, you're, 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 you, you've got no basis on which to craft either an immigration policy or a refugee policy that has integrity and has, I, I think, real uh, drive behind it. And it seems to me that, one, you have to hold on to the idea that if you are the baker from Damascus whose bakery is bombed and whose family is terrorized, if you're the girl from northeast Nigeria who Boko Haram drive out of the country, if you are the Rohingya in Myanmar, who's driven into Bangladesh and cannot safely go home, you're in a different position, frankly, than me, who applied for a job to come to work in the United States. Now, there are blurred, there's blurring in the middle, but I think that idea that, it, it, I mean, notwithstanding my past in politics, it would be safe for me to go back to the UK, so I can't claim that I wouldn't uh, be safe going back. And I think it's really important to hold on to that idea 
One, that a refugee is someone who cannot safely go home. And as it happens, my parents were both refugees, and they could not safely go back to Belgium, my dad in 1940, or my uh, mother to Poland. Uh, she was a refugee in 1946. The second point, in answer to your second question, though, is that migration does bring great, great benefits if it's properly managed. And if it's not properly managed, then you will lose the confidence of the population that you are uh, of the uh, host uh, community. And I think it's interesting that the countries that have managed to establish clear documentation for who comes in and out, clear fairness about who come, who's allowed to come and when they're allowed to come, have managed to build, and, and America has been a good example of this over the years, has managed to build a far more sustainable majority than uh, than others. Now, my question, or my, in a way, it's to the two Americans here, is about, the, is about the relationship between undocumented immigrants into the U.S. and documented immigrants into the U.S. Because what I see is that the people who are fighting against undocumented immigrants are also ready to take on the idea of documented migration. So the attack on the so-called dreamers is becoming an attack on the very idea of immigration itself into the US. And I think that speaks to the idea that over the, is it 20 or 25 years since the US has had a proper immigration, comprehensive immigration policy, that's, or an immigration overhaul, that's allowed some of the people who are against any kind of immigration to gain, if not the upper hand, at least gain more of a hearing than they deserve. I think it's very important that you stated all these distinctions because everything gets blurred um, and people need to understand the differences. I do think that there is kind of a middle ground where one could say that a child from Central America who cannot eat because his parents, her parents don't have enough money and then the parents put this child into uh, the hands of either somebody reputable or a smuggler and that they are suffering as much as maybe the baker in Damascus. And so that there really are some middle uh, issues that are harder to deal with. I do think that it would be very important for the United States to have a, uh, a whole overhaul of immigration laws. Um, we're not going to get there right now. Uh, but I do think that this country has I am on purpose wearing a Statue of Liberty pin today uh, because this country has thrived because of the number of people that have come in. But I, I also do believe in law, and so I think it's important to work something out. But if we can't have a law, then we at least have to be able to deal with the people that are here, especially the dreamers. I, I find the dreamers very compelling in every single way. And your story in terms of trying to figure out uh, a roadmap for others. Uh, these, they're people that, children that were brought here uh, without any knowledge of it, and um, you sound as much American as anybody, uh, and so I, I feel very kind of moved by the dreamers. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the problem in this country with immigration, documented, not documented, is the broken immigration system, right? If there was a system for people to come to this country legally, I think they would do it. Um, and going back to the point of uh, the difference between somebody who's a refugee and someone who's an immigrant, um, looking back, I've, I'm now a green card holder, so I, I've gone to Mexico three times now, and I see the poverty. Right, I see the poverty that people are living in. Um, my husband's from Culiacán, Sinaloa, which is where like everybody is like, well, the majority of people are like in drug cartels or like uh, in danger. And um, some people are fine with it. They just kind of like learn to live with it. But some people flee that, right? Because they think that their kids are gonna get into those things. So that's another reason why they leave. Um, so it might not be so much that I am in danger right now, but it's the future of my child. What does that hold for my child? And I think if any of us, I don't, you guys look pretty young, so I don't know if any of you are parents, but when you become a parent um, and you see the situation that you're in, and it was similar to what you were saying of a parent who does not have food, enough money to buy food for their child, they're gonna send their child off, or they're gonna have their whole family move to a separate country to have more opportunities, not only for them to be able to feed themselves, but to give that opportunity to their child to, get, to, to, to thrive and to get an education. And I think that's the story of a lot of immigrants, at least uh, my family, that's what it was. That's the reason why. And um, I do believe that we deserve uh, an opportunity to stay here. And there's a big controversy uh, about 
that it's not our fault that we as dreamers should get the the pathway to citizenship and that the criminals are our parents. I do not I do not like that statement at all and I I it goes back to what I said, right? Like our parents came here, they they're the original dreamers. They left everything behind. They left the language, the culture, everything to cross over and give us that opportunity to to be American because they know that we didn't have those opportunities back in our in our countries wherever that may be. Um, so yeah, so it, it is different, um, but I think we also deserve that that opportunity to be to be seen as humans and to to um, be able to thrive and give back, but also fixing these policies. Right, government has a big, big say in all of these issues, and I don't. Uh, as maybe you guys have been in politics, what? And this is like a question. I don't know if I can ask a question being Absolutely. a panelist. Okay. <laughs> but what can we do to push the government to pass an immigration reform, to pass policies that protect immigrants and refugees? What do we do as, as citizens, not on paper, but as living here or as green card holders, what can we do to push to get something done? Have different people in office. Uh, uh, I plan to run for office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I do think that part of it is going to speak to people in Congress uh, who need to hear your stories, which is why I think seeing people up on the Hill um, is very important. And then also, frankly, talking to your neighbors, because they are the ones that ultimately vote and will be the ones uh, that um, make all the difference. And so your story and uh, thousands of others is the best way to, to do this kind of thing. We do live in a democracy, and I think that that part is important. The other point, though, and I, I would like to, this is kind of a general statement, but most people would prefer to live in the country where they were born if they, in fact, could make a living. And therefore, I argue also for an, a comprehensive approach to all of this. The immigration now from Mexico is down because there are, the economic conditions are better. Uh, and why, when I teach or talk, I connect everything, it would be nice if we actually continued with NAFTA, that trade agreements actually help in terms of uh, empowering larger numbers of populations on the other side. You don't need a wall. What you need is economic um, livelihoods and economic opportunities for people in countries, because unless you are the girl who is being uh, tortured by Boko Haram, on the whole, you would prefer to live in the country where you are. And so I think that in addition to talking to people about changing immigration law, we need to understand the importance of trade and economics and the relationships between countries. I think, I mean, I've um, obviously been in politics and government in the UK, so I can't speak to the US in quite the same way. But what strikes me about the debate here that does have parallels elsewhere is that there's been a degree of complacency that has meant that the role of the US in welcoming refugees has not been defended with the kind of activism that it needs. And if you don't defend a position, then it gets rolled back. I think the immigration debate in Europe is a uh, different one. Uh, and there the issue that I think does maybe have some parallels here. It's one thing to say we've all got to live in this house together. It's a better thing to say let's all build this house together. Let's take actions in our places of work, in our communities that are actually common action rather than separate actions. And part of the European experience that has been, I think, very damaging is the separation of immigrant communities rather than the integration of immigrant communities. And from my point of view, it's very, very striking that the places in the world that are most open to immigration are those where there are actually the most immigrants, not the fewest. I mean, if you think about the Western world, it's the great cities that are melting pots. It's the places that have the fewest immigrants that have the most neurosis and fear about immigration. And that's true in the US, is true in the British Brexit debate, is true in the German elections, is true in the French rise of the National Front. The power of the so-called populist backlash is in places where there is actually the least integration, the least social and economic mixing. And I think there's a 
quite a chilling lesson there, that actually when people do things together, they learn that there's a common humanity. When they're separated, then they can be demonized. And I think there's a big lesson for that. I think the, the really hard part here is um, you, David, you were talking about globalization and all our interconnectedness. It's got a downside to it, which is that it's baseless to a great extent, and so people then group by their identity. Everybody wants to know, you know, what is your ethnic or linguistic or religious identity? And then the problem comes if it's, it's fine to want to know who you are, but if my identity hates your identity uh, and it's exacerbated by um, politicians or bad economic conditions, then we get into this kind of hatred issue. But the other part I think that you said that we need to get used to is that this is not a crisis. This is what is going on now, that these are, are people, this is going to go on, I hate to say new normal, but it is the new way that people are displaced in one form or another, either in their own countries or in other countries. And I have always said this, Americans are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. Uh, and the bottom line is we're, you know, when there's been a drowning of a child, then we can identify for a little while and say we have to do something about this. But seeing this as something that is going to go on for a considerable amount of time is something that we have to deal with. Can I just chip in on this, though? Because it, there's obviously a danger. Uh, I'm a former foreign minister. You're a former foreign minister. And the danger is we think um, it's got much worse since we were in office, and it would be much better if we were still in office. Um, but I think it's if you're talking about refugees, these are people who are fleeing war. They're not fleeing wars between states, they're fleeing civil wars. And the truth is, there are more hot civil wars in the world today than there were during the Cold War, and they are lasting longer. We are facing a crisis of global peacemaking and peace building and peacekeeping. As long as these fires carry on burning, I mean, we've just had reports this week for, for my organization, what's going on in South Sudan, what's going on, I've mentioned in uh, Myanmar, you have hot civil wars burning that are driving people from their own lands. And that crisis of global diplomacy is, I think, really serious because it, is, it means that this is a trend and not a blip. I mean, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Central African Republic. No one knows about the Central African Republic. It's a small country. But its civil war is actually burning away, propelling people out of the country. South Sudan, the world's newest nation, it's only five years old as a, as a country, country of 11 million people, one and a half million refugees from that country, seven and a half million people in humanitarian need. What's going on in Yemen at the moment is a crisis. It, it is it, the danger in my world, in my work, is I say Yemen is a humanitarian emergency. It is a humanitarian emergency. It's actually a political emergency. And unless we see that these humanitarian emergencies are actually a crisis of politics and a crisis of diplomacy, we're not actually going to get to the roots of the problem, however good our humanitarian aid workers are. And I think they are amazing. But humanitarian aid and refugee policy, if you like, that's OK for stopping the dying, but it doesn't stop the killing. And it's the killing that's driving people to flee from their homes. And unless we get better as a global community at stopping the killing, in other words, reinvigorate peacemaking, peace building, and peacekeeping, then we're going to be trying to run up a downward escalator for a very long time to come. Sorry, you, you launched us on this, this conversation by asking what can we do uh, you know, to, to, to push for change, and you were talking in particular about the immigration laws in the United States, and I just wondered if, uh, I, I just wanted to ask you about another aspect of, of your childhood that you haven't talked about yet, um, which raises one of these questions about, um, about our immigration laws, which is that when you were 16, uh, your mother uh, left, went to, to Mexico to, to process a visa, and you thought this was going to be a short trip to to request a waiver and to come back, and she ended up there for many years, which um, which implicates a part of our laws. The it's what we in immigration law call the three-year and ten-year bars. Uh, it's part. It, this is a provision that went into the immigration laws of the United States in 1996, the last time there was a comprehensive overhaul of our laws, and it's really split apart many families, in, including in this situation, it's someone who who is eligible for a visa but nevertheless ends up uh, apart from their children for many. Many years. Could you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so um, back in Mexico, um, we have these people called notarios, notaries. And to become a notario in Mexico, you have to go to more years of school than a lawyer. So then when our families come to this country and they find like, I guess, just, I guess driving down the street that it says notario, my sister found one. Uh, she went in there and this person gave her faulty advice. My sister was a US citizen for about three or four years already when she petitioned for my mom. She petitioned for my mom, my dad, and myself. Uh, and my mom asked me to come with them to Mexico. The process was only supposed to take six months. Um, and I was a really big nerd in school. So I was like, I cannot leave for six months. Like that's like half a year. It's only gonna take me so much longer to get into college. So in my mind, I made this perfect little story plot of like, okay, I am 16 right now, you're gonna leave, you're gonna come back. I'm gonna be not, not 17 yet. So you can petition for me when you come back as a green card holder because I'm still a minor. And my mom was like, it was hard for her to leave me behind because I was 16, um, but she did. She went on ahead to, to Mexico with my dad. Um, things got cut up in the system, it got clogged, we don't know. Um, so she was able, she was there. This, she's still there, by the way. She's still in Mexico. I'm 27 years old now, so it's been 11 years and she still hasn't been able to come back. So I don't know if the 10-year bar implemented or what implemented uh, her case, but the, we, to this day, don't know if her application was even processed. Like, we've asked immigration attorneys. Like, they don't know what, what happened. So I'm now a green card holder. I become a citizen in three years. So we're going to, I guess, now wait until I become a citizen to bring her back. So my, my story, even though it's taken this long, is a good story, right? Because now we have two potential solutions to my mom coming back to this country and being with us before she passes away. Because my dad passed away in 2011, and that was super, super hard for me. And when that happened, I was just kind of like, like in Spanish to say, well, I guess in English too, throw in the towel, like that's it, like I'm done. This isn't worth it. Uh, I'm just gonna go back to Mexico. The reason why I wanted to get an education was to um, be able to sustain my family, which was my mom and my dad. And if they're not here, what's the point? Like, why am I here by myself going through so much if, if they're not here with me? So my mom was like, no, you have to stay there. You know, like your dad already passed away. You did all that you could. Um, and when I went back to see my mom after 10 years, it was very emotional um, because I hadn't seen her for so long. And my biggest fear in that time of like, not having documents to seeing her was, what if my mom dies too? You know? And that's something that, yeah. I wish to no one. Yeah. You know, and my story isn't unique. This happens to a lot of people and they go their whole lives without being able to go back to their countries because of that lack of authorization to come back to this country. I have to say, in listening to this, this is un-American. This is not the America that we all know. Well, on that note, uh, there's, there's clearly so much for us to do. There's so much to do here in the United States, and there's so much to do globally. Uh, and sometimes it's overwhelming when we think about the entirety of it. Uh, but we all know, right, the trick is you, you, you pick a piece of it that you can work on and you get going on that. Um, and uh, I want to, in the spirit of, uh, of this gathering, of, of all of your commitments, uh, I'd like us to, to wrap up with some commitments to action, either suggestions for what other people can do or, or what, uh, what you might be doing what you, in the next year or so. I'll, I'll start here. I'm inspired by what, I, what I've heard among the participants here. Uh, and so on, on behalf of myself and the law school here at Northeastern, uh, at the end of November, we are opening the doors of our new Northeastern Immigrant Justice Clinic. Uh, we will be representing asylum seekers and others who are trying to navigate this extremely complex system here. Um, so now I'm gonna ask all of you in closing to just tell us something that you, that's on your agenda for the next year. Well, I uh, am kind of political. Uh, I am going to spend more time um, arguing and pushing the people that I know on Capitol Hill to work for immigration change policy. I am going to uh, <coughs> take some students with me wherever I go, and I'm going to keep talking about this. I'm not 
basically a normal refugee. I am a refugee, but uh, my story is not as complicated as all of this. But one of the things that I do like to do is to hand out uh, naturalization certificates to people at the ceremonies. Uh, and I do believe in the importance of opening the road to citizenship. And um, I did I do this fairly regularly, and all of a sudden I heard this man saying, can you imagine I'm a refugee and I just got my naturalization certificate from the Secretary of State? And I went up to him and I said, can you imagine that a refugee is Secretary of State? And that is what this country has been about. Um, I am also going to sign depositions and, and amicus briefs about uh, bans that are keeping people out of this country, and I'm going to use whatever voice I developed to make this stop. I think Madeline should run for office. Uh, I think now, you know, don't use that argument that you're too young to run for office, uh, Madeline. And if you do, I'll be your campaign manager. Um, the, the, big thing, the biggest thing I can do in the next few months is, is the following. Um, we, uh, there's a great organization called the MacArthur Foundation. They've launched a prize for um, $100 million to solve a big global problem. Uh, there were 1,900 applicants, and the International Rescue Committee is now down to the last four uh, to win $100 million. And we have identified the issue of education for refugee children who are under the age of eight as being the most neglected area of public policy in the refugee space. I mean, overall, less than 2% of global humanitarian funding goes on education, and the amount that goes on early childhood development is nugatory, is practically uh, zero. This is doubly stupid. It's morally stupid, but it's also the case that we all know from the brain science that it's the early years that are the most important for a child's development, and that Although you can see the brain damage that comes from the trauma of displacement and war, you can also measure how the right kind of interventions help reverse that brain trauma. And so we uh, are working and will, in the run-up to the middle of December when this is decided, we are working with the Sesame Foundation, who are a great American organization that helped bring uh, to the American inner city, Sesame Street, um, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, we're working with them to uh, use this $100 million to prove a new model of intervention for under eight-year-old children in the Middle East. We'll help about nine million children in the Middle East through this in initiative, and you can all help us win by making a flood on social media about why this is the right proposal to win $100 million. Um, so I, I'm going to do a couple things. Uh, one is continue to build in an innovative way solutions to solve problems in my community through technology. And I encourage all of you also to do that. Um, like I said, I'm not a tech person nor a business person. And here I am, a, a CEO of a tech company. So you can all do it as well. Um, another thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start preparing myself. I told a couple friends, and I'm telling you all now, uh, I'm going to become a citizen in three years, and I do plan to run for office. Yeah. I think it's up to us, right? Um, it's up to us to create change. Uh, I definitely agree with, with your point of we have to have different people in office, and I, I like to live by the, that motto says, if not you, who, and if not now, when? So it's our time. So if you tell me where your naturalization ceremony is going to be, I will come and give you your naturalization. <laughs> On that hopeful note, uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your participation.